Hey everybody, how are you doing? This is Brian and Courtney. We're back for another H to H live. I'm going to now set this up so that it actually works inside of our human to human Facebook group, which we can't do till we go live. So hold on one sec. Uh, let me see if we can get this going as quickly as possible. Let's see, share in a group. The group would be human to human marketing group. Boom, you're following along. I love it. And here <laughs> it goes. Uh oh. Live TV. We are publishing inside the group. Okay. Uh, so, really what excited to be here today. And here it goes. Uh -oh. oh, we have feedback. Uh oh. Live Boom. TV. <laughs> oh, my so let's close Very meta. I'm so confused. Inside the group. Okay. Uh, so, whoa, really excited to be here today. Wow. Hello. Hi. Live stream Hi. outside of a live stream. <laughs> it's like a round. Row, 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 gently down the stream. Streamception. <laughs> All right. I think I just fixed that, but now we know what not to do next time. Wow. It's our first time actually uh, streaming inside of Facebook at the same time. So thank you for bearing with us. It looks like we've got some really cool people in here already. Got Patricia, we have Maya, we've got Mitch, uh, we've got Tom Snyder. Tom Snyder. Tom, Tom Snyder. Snyder in the house, and Hello. lots of cool, <laughs> cool people uh, joining in as we go. So thanks for bearing with us on that. That was obviously the first time we're trying that, and we'll see how that Wait, goes. You get that. Only when you say him. We gotta stick to the rules on that one. So um, Chris so, looks that he is in and he is super choppy. I don't know if we left oh. is, he, is he in the green room? Hate it when that happens. All right. So we'll hopefully uh, Chris will be able to join us soon. I sent him a second invite. Uh, hopefully he can click that link and come on in. Um, but until Chris uh, joins us, uh, Travis will be playing the role of Chris and Travis today. Um, <laughs> would love to see uh, Travis do the both people. So um, so here we go. So, <laughs> Courtney, how are you doing today? I'm doing really come well. Come on, come on in. Oh, thanks. I sorry, I'm like here, get the hook. Uh, no, I'm doing really well. Good. Yeah, coming Good. off of a great trip uh, from San Diego, judging the San Diego Ad Fed American Advertising Awards. Thank you very much for inviting me. We had a great time. Awesome, awesome. Yes, it was a lot of fun. I got to fly my drone over the uh, lake. In my first time droning over the lake in San Diego. That was a lot of fun. Um, it's actually an ocean. That's an ocean, but yeah, it's a bay. <laughs> bay lake. It's a tiny lake, Pacific Lake. It's yes, very nice. it's a very large lake. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, when you say when I say lake, I mean ocean. So everybody knows. Yeah. Um, Mitch just asked, "What flying the drone? Nice, yes." Uh, Mitch, I'm going to share that with you soon. I see somebody coming in. Hey! We have a Chris in the house. All right. Um, can he hear us is the question. No, oh, he's gone. Oh, we just lost him. He is gone. Oh, we so, close. Chris. so close. So close. To having he's there. We knew it. We saw it. Um, so we know he, he has a button that makes it all, all come back again. Um, all right, so so Travis, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, let everybody know who you are and what do you do? All right, uh, my name is Travis Wright and I am a marketing technologist and the co-founder of CCP Digital. Uh, it's an, an ad agency based out of Kansas City, uh, right smack in the middle of the US, literally about 1,097 miles from a beach. Not, not that I'm counting. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, so I'm also a, uh, a writer. I, I write for Ink Magazine. I do a podcast with VentureBeat. We do the uh, weekly VB Engage podcast in which you were, a, you were a guest on, good sir. That's right. And recently wrote a book called Digital Sense with Chris Snook, who peeked in here a minute ago and then uh, peeked out. Well, um, so tell us a little bit about your, um, just your background. I'll dive in a little bit deeper. Um, what led you to where you're at right now? Well, you know, so diving back in, I mean, uh, so I've been in, I've been in the digital world for about 20 years when it comes to marketing. So I was, when I was going to school at the University of Kansas, um, I was actually working in the evenings at uh, Sprint, 
doing that 10 cents a minute stuff back in the day. So I was a telemarketer extraordinaire. <laughs> and uh, then whenever I finished school, I got a job at GTE Yellow Page and I was selling Yellow Pages. And I realized early on, that was like 96, 97, where a lot of these companies didn't really get digital marketing yet, right? They, they didn't have their domain names. There were so many amazing URLs available at that time. Looks like Chris is back again. Chris is back again. Are you here, sir? I've been here the whole time, man. I've been lost out there in the ether. I've been here the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you are back, good sir. When in doubt, just refresh three times. There you go. There you go. And if you go away, we'll, we will we will summon you again. But uh, so that was that was the kind of the beginning, and I intuitively figured out search uh, and SEO before Google was even a thing, right? And I just sort of kept growing and one of the things that's been it's been valuable in my career is actually headed going where the puck is headed not where the puck is that old you know sort of Wayne Gretzky term so when social media started coming out actually when uh, when paid search came out with with go to and overture and then google adwords i mean i i, I wanted to understand that and, and then when social media came in and then when the iphone and mobile marketing came in and, and then i was the uh, fast forward a little bit to um, like 2012 I was a, uh, on the uh, global uh, digital uh, social media team at Symantec for the Norton brand. And I just demoed so many different marketing technologies. And I was working with several different silos within the organization and understanding how these tools work, you know, which tools do what and how they all fit together. And, and this is sort of the beginning of the marketing technology stacks. And uh, so over the past like five, six years now, I bet I've demoed well, well over a thousand different marketing technologies. And, um, and so just, it's just the understanding of the space. And now it's like, now I see where things are headed now with the 5G and, and then Gen Z popping up down the road. And so you can just see where, where the space is heading. And so kind of always trying to, 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 to do, do great work where we are, but also keep an eye on where things are headed and sort of ramp myself up as we move towards that. Fantastic. You, um, you and I have had a great uh, uh, social relationship on meaning on social media and, and we met for the first time this last year, but it felt like we'd known each other for forever. So it was, it's great to, uh, Great to have met you in person and great to actually get to know you even better this year. So I'm looking forward to it. And Absolutely. might I say that Travis, you were my first podcast ever oh. in my life. Fun fact. Fun Never fact. Forget first. I know you, I, I was no longer a podcast virgin after you. So <laughs> thanks wow. for that. Excellent. You're welcome. <laughs> thanks for not screwing it up. So Chris, um, why don't we jump into your um your background tell us a little bit about yourself and um what what did, what's your background look like yeah, and the, how'd you get to where you're at the uh the the path of of serendipity i guess i i was a um i went to college because i wanted to keep playing football um they told me i needed to pick a major i majored in exercise physiology because they wouldn't let me major in music which is what i wanted to do i play the drums it's one of my very few hobbies but um so I picked that because I figured I'd lift weights and be a better football player. So those <clears> two <throat> projects lined up. Um, I used grad school as an excuse and became an entrepreneur by happenstance in 1999 um, and have never looked back. I've, I, I've had an interesting road of uh, some, some really glorious failures along the way and some, and some nice comebacks um, and, you know, netted out 17 years later, I think, 17, 18, almost, whatever. Um, you know, I, I fell into – digital and tech probably about a decade ago uh, just because of, as Travis said, you know, learning to see around corners, um, being curious, understanding where things were heading and wanting to be on the front of it. Um, and so, you know, it, it's been just a, there's been a lot of thought to it in the sense of I, I, I really intended, I wanted to become an entrepreneur. I wanted to build a big business. I wanted to do those things. Um, I still haven't accomplished that yet in the sense of my mind. I've, I've had some exits, but none of them that, that seemed to, fill that thirst. So I think I'll be doing this till I die and I enjoy it. That's me in a nutshell, as Austin Powers would say. <laughs> you know, glorious is the only way to fail, by the way. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, why, not, why do it any way else, right? <laughs> uh, you're not trying if you don't go glorious. Um, right. No, I, you know, I think uh, from those lessons, everything obviously makes sense in hindsight when you, when you want it to, if you want to make sense of it. And, um, you know, I'm excited. I've, I've never been more excited about where we are 
uh, right now. Um, and I'm just glad I have 17 years worth of pattern recognition to apply against it. I, I feel like I'm in my prime and um, that's, a, that's a fun place to be. Is, is that whiteboard behind you all pattern recognition? <laughs> that's actually a really interesting formula that um, cures uh, a lot of things that I can't discuss until um, ah. we're under NDA. But yeah, no, I can't even, I don't know. <laughs> We're under a, know, we're under a friend EA though. That's right? What, that's what yeah, I don't know what that is. I, you know, I did really well in math and really well in English until they started putting English in my math and then it all got jacked up. <laughs> it's not like peanut butter in your chocolate at all. No, no, it's definitely not. So, uh, yeah, so somebody smart, um, you know, put that up there and, and I can sell it though. I promise you, whatever that is. <laughs> right? I can fucking yes, sell it. That's I'm good. telling you that right now. <laughs> Well, I, I'm pretty sure it has to do with the flux capacitor um, yeah. from what, what I'm looking at. Right. But, um, <laughs> so so um, you two wrote this great book, Digital Sense. Love, uh, love the fact that I got a copy. Thank you guys so much. And, um, and I'm curious if you both can talk about why or what got you started in the first place. Um, how, did, how did this come to fruition between you two? Yeah, great question. Cold call. Great question, yeah. Cold call, right? So, so back. So the the intro story in the book, uh, we talk about the um, the Save Our Chief story and the whole uh, debacle around that scenario. And right after that, that was in 2012, and in 2013, I was speaking at the Denver Startup Week uh, in September, I believe, of uh, 2013. And Chris was on the panel that uh, that we put together. And, uh, and so we had had a great conversation and he was a smart dude and we were, we were, we were sort of jamming on some of the same things. And, uh, then fast forward, I think back into 2015 or so we reconnected and, uh, we were, we were having some conversations about some things that we were both working on and we literally decided, we said, you know what, maybe we should write a book Maybe we should do that. That sounds like a, that sounds like a good idea. And then two days later, Wiley, uh, sends, sends an email my way saying, Hey, uh, we've been reading some of your ink columns. We would love for you to pitch us a book. Would you be interested? And I was like, what? Dude, we just talked about writing a book, and Wiley has reached out to us about a book. This is magical. So you so, said no, thank right? you? So we said, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's so so not our jam. <laughs> well, yeah. that's, not, that's yeah, how I mean, the universe works, right? Like you say it out loud, and then all of a sudden, these serendipitous things just start happening. It's funny. I was just on a phone call with Chuck Hester, who's in our H to H group this morning. Love Chuck. And, uh, he, uh, yeah, right. He's a good guy. And he, he just told me on the phone, he said, I want to get more speaking gigs. That's my, cause I asked him, what's your, what's one of the things you'd like to do more of? And he said, I'd love to speak more. I really love speaking. And we got off the phone and all of a sudden he had an email in his inbox that invited him to come be a, a keynote speaker. And so he replied, he replied back and he said, man, I just, I just needed to say it. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, um, so, so you but guys, it's oh, oh, a powerful thing. People will love I, chapter five. We, we won't tell them why, but they'll love chapter five if that if that gets them going. That kind of uh, serendipity. Chapter five explains exactly how to do that. Mm -hmm. Let's let's say you did tell us about chapter five. What <laughs> would you say? I'd say it, it read it. No, uh, you know, I mean, what we just talked about. It, it's it's not funny, but it is funny, right? It's the it's Joe Pesci funny. Um, you know, I reached out to Travis because I've been working on a lot of the concepts in in the book. I've been working on a book but it was incomplete. And I knew without a marketing technology, like guru, I wasn't going to be able to do it justice. So it was just sitting around in my head and in paper. And anyway, so that, that was the Genesis from my side of like, I reached out to him and said, Hey man, I think you'd be the perfect guy. We've never met other than that one time, but you know, I've been reading your stuff following you like the social relationship you talked about. And I'm like, I think you'd be the perfect guy to do this with. Are you in? And he's like, I've always wanted to do one. Sure. I'm in. And then the Wiley thing happened. But, um, you know, I think, again, both he and I resonated with the fact that uh, we've built our careers having a direction, but not necessarily being married to or attached to um, how we got there. And and sometimes I certainly was. I thought I had to get there a certain way. But I think at the end of the day, if you know where you're trying to get, um, everything else kind of has to line up. It doesn't come the way you want. Yeah. But that's what Chapter 5 talks about. It doesn't like you, you can say, I want to go get more speaking engagement. It doesn't like always show up like an email that minute from a person you want a keynote for, but it does start to happen if you, and then you just gotta look for those signals. And, and we talk about it more through the lens of, if you wanna make change in your organization, which is what this book's about, you know, you have to understand what you're up against, right? And you're up against all kinds of inertia. Otherwise that change would already be there in your organization. So 
a lot of times that gets overwhelming. And what we did in chapter five and why people should focus on chapter five is we tried to put it through the lens of what can I do to lead from where I am? What do I have to change internally in my thought process? How does that look? What's the picture that I work from to get there? And, uh, and, then, and then you can repeat it. So that, it, it diverts, but it's really designed to help people pull the, the rest of the book together um, so they can actualize it. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 go ahead, Travis. Yeah, it's one of, it's one of those things. I, I always talk about how, you know, you, you can't see Wi-Fi, right? You don't see Wi-Fi waves around. We don't see, we don't see 4G or LTE. We don't see AM, FM waves. We don't see those things. And when you realize that a thought is actually a thing, you send out this little, you don't see it, right? But the more powerful of that thought gets over time and the more energy, like when you have a goal and you sort of are working towards that goal and that's your definite purpose and you're, you're working towards that and, and that's your sort of your, your beacon and your guiding light, you know, that thoughts get stronger because you're putting more energy towards it. And we sort of teach in here how to get your organization to do that, to buy into your, your company goals and to buy into your, your overall objectives. Then you have, a hundred people, 500 people, a thousand people all sort of working towards that same thing. And that can become very, very powerful if you get everybody to buy in. But there's these different types of personalities within the team, right? You have these people who are motivatable, who you can, you know, can do to sort of sway to move towards your idea. And you also have these, what, what we call zombies, which are those people that are the sort of negative Nancy's within your organization. They're always trying to find ways to bring it down and tell you why it can't happen and all this other stuff. And so, it's just a magic, it's sort of a, it's sort of a, I would say magic, but it's just sort of this, this process of how to get people to buy in, how to get rid of the people who are those negative people who you're not going to, you're not going to change those types of, of, of attitudes. So you got to get them off the bus, bring in more people who can, can uh, buy into your vision and, and get you guys all moving towards it. So digital transformation through mindset. So a little bit of uh, psychology in chapter five. Mm -hmm. I, I, you guys kind of screwed up a little bit though. And I, I don't mean to point it out, <laughs> okay. but, Doesn't shock me. but I will. Um, you, you accidentally put me on the back of your book. Yeah. Um, that was unintentional. I'm it's sorry. Really small, it's really small. <laughs> it's really and small font. It's really small font, though. That's I mean, true. Most, that's that true. true. It's probably right next to the lake in San Diego. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I was going to ask if you can't see Wi-Fi and you can't see AM FM, but they're there. How do you explain Santa? Mm. Yeah. Well, I can see him. I just took my kid to the North Pole experience in Flagstaff and you go through this portal on a bus and it takes you right to him. I don't know what you're talking about. Very easy. That's mm. a flag, by the way. Interesting. Wow. By the way, my kid, my kid watches this, so don't fuck it up for him. It, <laughs> that's real. He, he watches well, this, so I'm going to drop an F-bomb. He's probably he's not worried about Santa. <laughs> right. Daddy, what's that word? That's so, like that. He's... So talking about, speaking of Santa, um, what did you mean in your first chapter by your organi organization needs a digital sense DNA la layer? What is it, speaking of Santa? <laughs> Just trying speaking to get us back on track, that's all. <laughs> Speaking of bread, that's a great segue. Speaking of bringing well, gifts to the world. Yeah, I, I mean, what what I what I know I meant by that when I speak it to people is, is <clears throat> you know, you Elon Musk talked about we're all going to have a thing through the jugular vein, right? At some point at Recode last year, that's going to give us a layer of digital sense. I wasn't going there. I think the DNA is part of your culture and everything else. It, it it's understanding that um, we exist now in a world that is all the Wi-Fi and all that, like that's all in real time. That's all here. And that um, we all exist in that. So we can, we can be prepared for it or we can not, we can pretend like it doesn't matter or it does, but the, the information that's traveling back and forth is real. Like you can, you can say the wrong thing and start a war. You can, that can happen now, right? You can have fake news that becomes viral and causes people to do things. And so <laughs> there's all different consequences. There's all different consequences that just come with living in a digital society, which we live in. We're not going to go backwards. And so as an organization, what is our, you know, how are we going to live in that society? What's the DNA culture, the boundaries, the rules of engagement? What are we going to, how, who are we going to be, right, in that world, both online and off, because there is really no difference now. So it's, it's defining it for yourself, but it's paying attention to the fact that you have to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's really, you know, the, when you weave through a whole organization, I mean, if you're not digitally savvy today, 
then chances are, what we people have been saying this for a long time, but chances are in three to five years, you're going to be irrelevant if you do not finally understand how to integrate digital throughout your whole business. Because now we're coming to a world, here we are in you know, February 2017, in another three years, 5G is going to be here, right? And 5G, the speeds are going to be so incredibly fast where on this device, we're going to get, you know, 30 to 40 gigabits a second coming through our phones, right? There's going to be so many opportunities that, uh, that that's going to allow. But if you don't have some of these basic, you know, components within your business and the foundations of, of being savvy with digital and, and understanding the customer through the lens of a customer experience and, and weaving social throughout your whole business, right, then you're going to have some serious challenges. And so I think that's one of the parts of that that, you know, and it goes back. One of the things that, that first hit me was the chief story where I sent out a tweet to them in, in 2012. They, in three minutes later, they responded back with a very venomous tweet that turned into this whole thing called Save Our Chiefs, which we ended up turning into a movement in the Kansas City area where we ended up getting the general manager, Scott Pioli, and the, 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 the manager fired over time. And it was, it was really crazy. We, yeah, we blacked out the stadium there by using the media and we crowdfunded almost $7,000. And it was like, man. It was just so interesting how they just they lacked complete digital sense in that moment to engage me with venom, and because I was a pissed off fan, grew up right, <laughs> and so it doesn't really work to to hit fire with fire or throw gasoline on a fire, and so a lot of organizations do that sometimes knowingly and sometimes unknowingly, and uh, it can have major consequences to your business. Mm -hmm. Well, I think not just the business. I mean, you look at the. I don't want to go down the, the political rat hole here, but you know, you, you think about just the general digital digital sense of the world as a whole and how much of an issue it can cause when people aren't able to think through the consequences of their actions of that vitriol that is consistently spit out there. I mean, do you guys have any like well, quick think, advice? Yeah, I think well, I think the, without going down the political rabbit hole, I think there's there's a there's a thing that we have to decide as as a society that is because something can work, is it what we should do? And and I think what we learned is that there's things that have never worked before that now work, right? In earned media and in and in getting attention and in using all these tools that are digital to to shock you know to shock a result, right? And to do that. Um, and, and now we have to now we have to put code of ethics around that. We have to understand, you know, <laughs> like certain things can't be undone. And I'm not, and I'm not picking on any one person or any one thing. I'm saying that it doesn't matter what's happened recently or to date. It's just the reality of living in this society is that we have to start to establish a code of ethics for what it means to be an organization with digital sense, what it means to be a human being, what it means to be an individual, what it means to be a football player, what it means to be whatever we care about, because anything's possible now. And <laughs> um, we're not gonna. Human beings will not evolve. We have not evolved at the pace of at the pace of our tools. And Re Rebecca Costa wrote a great book called The Watchman's Report. I don't have to plug somebody else's book, but we talk about it in a digital sense. It, it's a must read as well because it talks about what happens when humans manufacture complexity faster than they can deal with it. And and so I think the DNA layer and the solve for it is just start to slow down and think about everything we do has a consequence. And just because we can do it, should we? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Everybody's chasing clicks. You know, they're all, we're all even the media in a lot of ways, they're, they're chasing traffic. And so they're going to say things in certain ways to appeal to certain sensibilities. And, you know, and in some cases, they're not always 100% forthright with they just sort of skew the stories because it's this clickbait mentality in a lot of ways. And so, you know, it, it's so true. There, there should be ethics throughout all organizations, and they're, they're sending things out through the lens of truth, first and foremost, instead of trying to skew, you know, a lot of times the media is really public relations more so than actually fact sharing in, in most mm -hmm. cases today, it seems like. Oh, absolutely. Well, first of all, before we go on, I think between the two of you, you said human about five times. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right on. <laughs> human to human. Uh -oh. Twice, oh, twice boy. Did it again, Travis. That, that in of itself is a rat hole, FYI. Um, but I, I think that you bring up a really good point. And is, is this why do you think it feels like the Wild West out there right now in terms of finding the boundaries of ethics? Because what we're learning is in this social world is there is not one lane of ethical perspective. 
it it means something slightly different to everybody and now we're like what it feels like crazy town yeah i mean you know i think again everyone's gonna have a different set of core values right um but it but i do believe that most people if they had a gun put their head would make the same decision right which is please don't pull that trigger um most people would do that so i think if you take the the percentage or whatever it is that wouldn't choose that um we all kind of baseline at a certain level of, okay, no, not that, right? And then how we get there is whatever we get there. And we should have those individuals and, and freedoms. <clears throat> companies companies have a chance to build a relationship. And, and again, back to, you know, saying human again, because I like rewards. Um, you know, when, when a brand is trying to sell something, they're just trying to solve a problem. They think they can do it better, faster, cheaper than the next person. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. And you should go make as much money as you possibly can. But as it relates to solving that problem for your customer in a way that is truly, you know, whatever you decide is valuable, um, you know, and, and human in a way to do it. And companies are employ, employ all the people, right? So it's like the first customer is your employees, which we talk about a little bit. The second customer is whoever your problem you're solving. Companies have a great opportunity to, to make that a non-question about how do we get to the ethics thing, right? Because companies can decide how they're going to grow in the future, what they're going to sell, how they're going to make their money, what their business model is going to shift to. Media companies have a challenge because their business model hasn't evolved and they haven't found a way to replace, you know, the, the click problem. Right. But as an organization, if, if what we're starting to do, I, I got to believe some people get sick to their stomach on mainstream media or wherever media it is putting out fake news or flat out lying to people or watching chaos happen because of something they ran with. I've got to believe at some point we hit a critical mass where people go, okay, I'm not doing this anymore. Mm -hmm. Like I don't care about my celebrity. I'm not doing this. I don't know when we'll get there, but I think at some point every business gets there and then, and then you get innovation because you go, well, there's still a need for, <laughs> there's still a need for news. There's still a need for being informed and mm -hmm. someone comes up with a way to do that sustainably and, and in a new business model and then everything else goes away. Yeah. Um, what we have to find a way to do is as human beings, have empathy for each other and, and, and build organizations that somehow can have empathy for not only our end customer, but our employee customer so that we can ride through that chaos without nuking each other. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the tough part. We're going to have the chaos, but we've got to find a way to, you know, and I think companies can do that. I think, I think, you know, at the end of the day, that can, that can be a safe haven if, if the leadership is committed to it. Yeah, it's kind of systematic though with, within our within our whole culture. And Mitch made a great point over here. It's like it's all about doing your due diligence and thinking just a bit before clicking, responding, or engaging. And you know, if you look at our school system, they there's it's in a lot of ways it's set up in a way to to not create critical thinkers. Right. School is basically sit down, shut up, listen to what we're going to tell you. We want you to regurgitate those facts to us later. And if you do not get those right, then you're going to get a bad grade. They, it's not set up in a way to sort of to to challenge individual uh, characteristics of people to to grow areas of strength. Right. It's trying to make everybody the same. And what happens is a lot of school turns out all these people lack critical thinking. And that way they can be sort of fooled by this fake news. Right. So. When you have that challenge of, you know, the educational system, you know, lacking in critical thinking, well, it, it applies to digital sense in a way is that sometimes it's not always intuitive for people how to make that next step and how to move in the right direction. And so there's a, there, in some cases, there's some unlearning that needs to happen for people to be able to get outside of their filter bubble and, and realize that, you know what? I, I'm I, I love doing that. You know what? I will always go and look at other side and other points of view because I want to know what they're thinking and what they're saying because you know what? I can empathize with them then. I'll understand what their talking points are. And I, and I think it builds relationships a little bit better as well. But um, not every organization has that ability to, to or, or people within that organization have that skill of critical thinking. So guys, we have just a few more minutes before we're going to take questions from everyone. If you're new to H2H chat, then uh, follow along on Twitter is probably the best place. Uh, you can go to hashtag H2H chat and pose your question there. Just to make sure you use the hashtag and we'll be able to pull your question and ask uh, either Tra uh, Travis or Chris your question um, there. So definitely make sure to do that. We are, um, we are just nearing the end of the first half, so we're going to be starting with questions in just a few minutes. Um, I'm curious, guys, as you, um, as you wrote the book, you actually talked about a model or maybe even several models. 
Um, I just got it, so I haven't had a chance to actually go through uh, every nook and cranny yet. But how? What is what is an organization out there that you believe maybe follows this model, and you look at them and you go, "Wow, they really do have digital sense." Um, what what? And, and and actually, before you answer that, I wanted to congratulate you because. Uh, we are trending on Twitter right now. So we're number 46 in the United States trending on Twitter. So Ooh. congrats to everybody out number there. That is, uh, <laughs> we got trigger happy uh, clapping yeah. here. And <laughs> it's belated for all the humans that you said. That oh, okay. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> so so nice. congrats, everybody. Thank you all for tweeting so much and, and supporting. Uh, also, again, bring your questions up. We're going to be starting questions here real soon. Uh, anyway, go ahead and, and uh, Travis or Chris, which, which um, uh, why, don't, why don't we start with, uh, why don't we start with Chris since uh, we left off with Travis. What, what, what organization do you think represents the best of digital sense? Um, well, I, I'm dying to work them at some level. So they haven't, they haven't uh, to my knowledge, because I don't think anyone there's read the book yet, um, use the experience marketing framework that we, we lay out. But, but Southwest um, definitely is doing something of, of that nature. And, and the reason, and I'll tell that through a quick vignette, you know, most of us have flown Southwest at some point, whether you like them or not, I think most people would agree that they are very efficient at what they do. I, I fly them like 30 to 40 times a year. And, um, I had a change of flight. I had screwed up. It was my fault. I, um, I had booked a flight coming back from Thanksgiving. My wife and my son were with me. And so I thought there was only one flight at 650 because usually flying from the West Coast, that's how it is. Turns out there was two. One was going through Midway. One was going through Baltimore. I'm on the Midway one. The wife and kid are on Baltimore. Oops. So the day before, I'm like, and this is the day before like Sunday of Thanksgiving weekend, right? So I'm like, Saturday, I'm calling them going, hey, uh, I, I don't know how this happened, but I should this up. Long story short, no fee, right? Um, no, no change problem. They, they, I didn't have enough reward points to make the change, but because I fly with them so much, they just made the change. The reward points were added to my account and deducted in a matter of like before I could refresh the screen. And long story short, I got on the same flight with my wife and son and we flew home and there was no issue. Right. And when you think about all that it takes to enable that you have to, a, you have a call center, someone picked up the phone and answered the phone. Right. So you have that person in that interface and they had to somehow have the same login to be able to look at my account, look at the flights and understand the challenge, change the flight. And then that was all communicated through everything, ticketing, whatever. And they, and then there was no fee and there was no, and then they had to find out where to get the reward pool money. Cause I didn't have enough and they weren't going to charge me for it. Cause they were being nice. And like, that sounds simple, but when you really think about it, most companies don't do that. I could give you another example. I don't want to throw anybody in the bus where that did not happen. The other for something way less expensive. And it was 45 minutes of my wife's time trying to solve a small little issue. And we got nowhere. And after 45 minutes, all you got was frustration and 45 minutes, you'll never get back. So Southwest does a hell of a job using, using what I would believe if they saw the experience marketing framework, we go, yeah, we don't necessarily think of it that way, but that's exactly what we do. Right. It's really hard to connect all those things. You're right. Well, and then um, it's, hard, it's hard to connect the silos too. Like it's not just about yeah. connecting the things, a lot of companies have connected the things, but then you have to have the culture and the, and the ability within your, you know, marketing technology infrastructure, whatever it is to enable it to happen, you know, on the ground and in your organization when you have multiple offices and people in different locations. So, you know, kudos to them because they're doing a lot of that right. Yeah. Well, it goes beyond the culture. It also extends into the training, the materials, the taking time to do all of that, the checking in, and then the extending the trust to your employees to just know that they're going to make the right decision in that moment. Yeah, the hiring, the firing, the all that, right? Yeah, so it's crazy, crazy huge. Huge. Yeah, another, another one was that I would sort of say that I think is doing a very good job on it is, is Disney. And I've had, had the opportunity to, to speak at Disney and kind of see the behind the scenes of what was going on. And even last year, I went to um, – Shanghai Disney with uh, with Robert Scoble. I was out there with a, a Huawei event, and it's unbelievable. They actually built that whole um, Shanghai Disney for about three billion dollars, and they built it in virtual reality first. 
That way they could walk through the park and see how customers are going to experience certain things. And then they would move certain areas and say, you know what, we don't want Tomorrowland here. Tomorrowland's gonna be much better over here and we should put the Tron ride here. And then they would they would rebuild it in VR and they'd go and walk through it again and be like, okay, very interesting. And they all have those magic bands, right? You can, you can uh, do your fast pass. And the way that some of that stuff is set up, it's, it, it's pretty interesting how you know, they, they view things through the lens of, of customer experience most of the time because that's where their dollars, that's where their dollars are coming from. So there's a, there's a lot of organizations who are doing things right. And there's a lot of organizations out there who, who in some ways have no clue. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, we have to transition into the Q&A portion of H2H chat. We've got so many questions coming in. I, I uh, thanks, thanks to Courtney for keeping you guys busy because I'm actually collecting <laughs> massive amounts and Maya behind the scenes ca uh, catching ma a great amount of questions coming in. So we're going to try and uh, work through them. Um, I'm the dancing <laughs> man. That's my job. Thank you so much. And so we are, we're, we're going to go right in. All right, here we go. Uh, let's see, the first one's from Janet Fouts. She said, how can we bring a code of human ethics to digital? Wow. Um, you know, someone who's, done, yeah, someone who's done a lot of great work on that is a friend of mine, Gerd Leonhardt, out of, uh, out of Switzerland. Um, if you don't follow him, he's just uh, G. Leonhard at on Twitter and stuff. But he's, he's written a book called Technology versus Humanity. He's spending most of his time now talking about the ethics challenge so I, I i would defer to say follow him or read his stuff because he's got better answers than i would have i think you know generically my answer would be what can i do about it I, again you guys are the human the human people right i think start there just just ask the simple dumb questions of like does this feel good to me because i mean we're all different but at the end of the day we have six human needs right and and like you know we all revolve around the same sun um so, you know, simplify it by just saying, does this, is this something I want? And, and if you're running a company or if you're leading the market behind a company, it's the discipline to speak up when, when it's not. And so, look, I get where we're trying to go. The objective is clear. I'm on board with the objective. I hate how we're trying to get there. Well, what's the answer? I don't have the answer. But what I do know is this isn't one. So, again, back to Chapter 5, like if the objective's clear and we're going to lock in on that, fine, I'm all in. But we need to start challenging ourselves to get there a different way. And that takes guts and you might get fired and whatever, but you live in a world of abundant opportunity today. I mean, you know. I feel like I wanna help you make chapter five like a verb, you know, inside of companies whenever something's not working, five. you feel like chapter, chapter five, five of five. five. Chapter five. five. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, chapter five of five or something. Yeah, yeah, well, you, you pressure right on. I think part of it is about empathy, right? And. Everyone, you know, I know that that I came here to America through uh, my my grandparents. They were they were immigrants. One grandparent came in the 1600s. Another one came in the 1700s. Right. And, so, and everybody lives in different places. They all come from different areas of the world, you know, and in a lot of ways, there's not enough empathy in the world or, or, or viewing through other people's lenses, through the shoes that they walk in. Right. And I think we all, in, in, in a lot of ways, we all have sort of our own perspective and our own viewpoints, but very rarely or not often enough do we actually say, hmm, how did this person get to where they are and why do they think the way they think? Because they're the lump sum of all their experiences, all the dogma that they were delivered all throughout their life, all the political bent of their family members and the school that they went to and all their, the lump sum of all of this stuff. I, I, I have a statement that I've always said, you know, I think I came up with in like 2002 or 2003 is that, you know, it really is the center of influence to you or the, the people that you hang around. Uh, the, and there's, the, there's always been that one quarter that you are the core sum of the, the top five people you spend the most time around. Right. But I came up with it and said, hey, it's your circle of influence that really de de determines how you view the world in a lot of ways, right? And I tell my kids this, I said, look, if you wanna fly with the eagles, you can't be hanging out with the turkeys, right? Or I'll say this, I say, you can't be, if, if you want, <laughs> you, you can't be hanging out with turds because you gotta flush them because not, they're gonna bring you in the toilet with them if you don't flush them quick enough. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's, that's a language you gotta drop with your 11 year old sometimes so they can get it. They're like, oh, what, what about eagles? I don't care about eagles. Oh, I don't wanna be a turd. You know? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, you know what? I, you brought up a really good point is what what allows people new perspective is travel. So maybe virtual reality could really help teach empathy uh, to people that don't have the resources or uh, uh, time to travel. Well, the, you know, the other thing is, is not to not to solve that mountain of problem with the education. But I think, you know, the more um, that young children in, in their learning you know, years early on can be nurtured from from an EQ standpoint, the better STEM and all that is obviously a need. We need to get better at that. We have a big demand, but you know, it's it's very easy to fall into, oh, STEM is going to be the answer. If if all we do is teach us how to quantify, um, we're we're gonna be really sad in, in five to ten years. I mean, we have to start to value uh, emotional intelligence more so because um, if you've read Kevin Kelly or any of that stuff, you know, cognification of everything is happening. It'll be like electricity. So it's not going to be a big deal. AI will be in everything. So as everything else gets smarter, we have to get uh, wiser in, in the sense of how we, how we feel and how we relate to people. Um, and I think that's the human advantage that you'll never be able to take away, at least for the next couple hundred years. Okay, so um, so the next um, next question we've got is from Stacy DePolo, a wonderful friend of HG Chat of ours, and also um, uh, works at GoDaddy, wonderful company. So um, her question right up is <laughs> right up. Wait, where are you, Chris? I'm in their hood. I'm in Scottsdale. Oh wow. Okay, I didn't know. I actually did not know your location. So. Um, okay, how can we support values we hold dear without val uh, vilifying those who, with whom we disagree and soften the, in, in air quotes, disgusted vibe? Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know more context than that, but my, I, that brings up a whole different challenge. We've got to get back to a, a healthy debate. And, and I think, I don't know the answer to that either. What I do know is that um, we don't know how to have a healthy debate anymore. You know, we, we found this country on debates. Um, John Adams and, and Thomas Jefferson were vi like, like bitter rivals. Um, and yet, you know, they were quoted on their deathbeds, which they both died 50 years after the founding of, or after the uh, Declaration of Independence on July 4th, both died the same day. And they were both quoted as saying, at least there's still Jefferson, or at least there's still Adams. So there was a respect level that although they were bitter rivals on policy, although they were bitter rivals, they were able to debate and still have a, a respect for one another. And um, whether it's the speed of information, whether it's just apathy, I don't know what it is, but we've lost the ability to disagree and, and still respect someone. I am not a fan of the Patriots. I am not a fan of Tom Brady, but he is the greatest of all time. And that organization is the greatest dynasty ever. If you just look at the facts, it doesn't mean I like them. It means I understand and can respect the fact that they did something that no one else has been able to do. And so we have to get back to some level of healthy debate. Um, and in companies, it's tough, you know, because it's tough. People have little power positions and they like to hold on to them. And my answer would be, you know, use chapter five, five it or whatever <laughs> we're going to call that and figure out, figure out how to mind game them, mind game around it. The best way to get someone to do what you want is to make them think it's their idea. Oh, that's so true. <laughs> that is so true. You know, if you position it in a way, and I, I've done that quite a little bit. It's, it's a little bit of a chess match sometimes, but it's like, you know, if you're positioning, uh, we just did that with a client the other day where they were trying to figure out a hashtag for, for an event. And, and they, a lot of them were just really long and not good. And uh, the one that was really good that I liked, I was like, hold on, let's, Let's go through all these other ones first, but then when you pitch it to the right people who you want, when you're pitching the right, give them this one near the end. That way they all go, oh, that's a great one. We love that one. And just that sort of subtle pitching within, <laughs> the, the way you position it, it actually, that was the one that they chose because of the way, if they had said that one first, that probably wouldn't have been the one they would have, would have chose. But that that's part of the, part of the, I think it really still comes back down to empathy is that, now what's happened with the, I mean, it's just the, the nature of, of politics now is if somebody disagrees with, with uh, one certain stance, then, then, they're, then they're evil and they're the devil. And how could they even possibly think differently than the way I do? And that's one of the reasons why I do look at both sides of the picture, right? I want to read what, what both sides are saying. That way I can try to help find some common ground. And, and really that's part of it is that if, if people are vilifying people that they're disagreeing, then you really have to strive to try to find what is that common ground, right? For me, I look at it and I say, you know what? We are all citizens of this planet Earth, right? And if you think of how big the universe is, our problems are really 
minuscule. We really don't matter when it looks at the grand scheme of the universe. But when we look at it in our own sort of the microcosm of our perspective, everything is so big and so important. And our, our opinions are so big and so important. And uh, it needs to be our way or the highway and screw you. And, you know, we're mad about it. And, and that doesn't work. There's got to be common ground. Like, like Chris said, we've got to find a way to, to have healthy debates. That way we can find solutions together because what happens is if one side is the one that is always the one making all the rules, there's going to be the other side that's feeling completely left out. And eventually what ends up happening throughout the entirety of all civilization, those people eventually rise up and then, you know, start over again. You reboot Rome 2.0. And uh, so we really have to figure out what is it? Uh, live together or die alone or something like one, that one quote. I don't remember exactly what it is. But <laughs> figure out right. a way to live together. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so guys, I'm going to, um, I'm going to do a super fast Q and a now, cause I want to get, make sure that pow, pow. most of everyone's Q, uh, questions get answered. So, uh, we'll do like a 30 to 45 second answer, uh, round if you don't mind. Um, I know I'll try, we'll try to answer everybody's questions, but at the same time, if everyone can be, uh, okay with knowing that your answer may be condensed, uh, we're, we're, we're giving them a challenge here. And we just raised our national trending to number 35 in the United States. Oh, uh, nice. so, keep, so, so the point is, keep talking. We're on fire. You're doing a good job. Nice. All right. So the next question is from Mitch. He actually dropped it into Huzza, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list it here. Uh, it's for both Chris and Travis broken down. Have you found any similarities about achieving success on the athlete field and success in business, digital, and life. Uh, Travis, same question regarding comedy. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Travis, <laughs> are you? That is, that is as quick as you can be. For sure. You uh, wanted a fast answer. Yeah, yeah uh, no, I'll give you my 20 seconds. So my 20 seconds is yes. And I think, you know, my example of that is um, I loved football. What football taught me that I didn't realize it at the time was physically you hit the ground every 20 or 30 seconds and then you choose to get up and you don't necessarily think about it. Um, but in business, that's what I've carried over is that um, football gave me the lesson of just get up, just get up, just get up. And there's always another play if you choose there. And so in business, when you get knocked down, you just kind of get up and, and it doesn't mean your bell, bell's not rung, but that's, that's the parallel. I think I've seen that and I've witnessed that in athletes. I've seen that in military people that I've worked in business with as well. They have a different, you know, version of that. That's probably even stronger. Yeah. As far as comedy goes, you know, so I've done, I, did, I first got up on stage doing stand-up comedy in 1995 and I was horrible. And, you know, it was, I was so nervous going up there and doing it. And I tell you what, there's, there is, there is um, a lesson in, in keep, trying keep working on your craft and keep getting better i mean i think that's part of the things that i learned most about it is that you know what if i say something that i think is hilarious and other people laugh i want to jot it down i want to you know work on it i want to i want to make it better and so i've always taken that process of learning and growing and testing out things and trying new things and not being afraid to fail school teaches us that again don't fail if you get an F, that's the worst case scenario. But in real life, you collaborate a lot. And I think that's been part of the part of the funnest part of comedy is that all the other comedians you get to hang out with and you joke around with and they're helping you make your jokes better. And they said, oh man, if you'd have said this with that one, that would be hilarious. And then so that sort of collaborative nature of comedy and then the parties after comedy <laughs> is <laughs> awesome too. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a question here from Jason Martin. In fact, we have a, a number of questions. Uh, Jason, thank you so much for um, all of your great questions. We're, we're going to certainly try to uh, ask at least one or two. Um, do you think the best training for a digital marketer today is to spend time in the real world that their customers live in uh, to see the pain points? He, I, he, he did a tweet, so I, I would expect he'd, he'd say, or is there something else? I'm adding that on. I would say yes. If, you're, if your intuition is telling you that, then it's right, in my opinion, um, which is just one opinion. But I would say yes. I observe people all day long. I think, you know, my 20-second version, uh, there's a tool for everything. There's, there's stuff that um, we can do that I don't even know of yet, but it's a Google search away or whatever, right? And what there isn't is there isn't observance. So if you walk around, you watch people at – at stadiums, watch people in the mall, watch people at the office, and just look at what they do, not what they say, but what they do, you'll gain a lot of insights into what will work or not. Yeah. And Another there's, thing, there's a tool for it. There's a tool for it. Yeah. And, and really, I think that 
another thing that really comes in handy, I think that you mentioned that part of the question is interview your customers, right? By doing that and you talk to them, you actually are going to hear words that they're going to use that you might not have thought to use in your marketing. If you talk to enough customers, they're going to tell you what they're, what all the problems are. They're going to tell you all the keywords and all the things that they're thinking about pertaining to it. And in a lot of ways, if you can interview potential customers before you even build your product, you can get your marketing plan all in place. You can get all these things in place prior to even building it to know if it's going to be viable or not. So tapping into the minds of customers or future potential customers is, is invaluable. So um, it's funny because uh, <laughs> Stacy uh, DiPolo said, thanks for the great answers to you too. I just want to make sure I, I mention this. Let's chapter five this thing. <laughs> nice. So, you just turned chapter five into a verb. Boom, that is awesome. Boom. Yes. Um, Mark, Mark Babbitt said, how can a legacy brand switch from a command and control to a trust your employee culture? Oh, that's a tough one. 20 seconds, huh? You, uh, you can take 30 seconds for that well, one. Well, I mean, well, I think you can't if you don't decide to, right? Uh, and so if you're a command and control culture, can that still work? You know, does there's not? I don't think there's a world that exists that says command and control can't work. I think command and control can mean different things to different people. So if it's highly dictatorial, if it's hell to work at, if it's like a prison, good luck finding quality people because there's really awesome places to go, and um, everyone with one of these can start a multi-million dollar a year business and lifestyle it out if they want to. So you're up against a, a, a tough dynamic. Um, if, if you don't think about how you command and control, there's plenty of well-run companies that are command and control oriented, Amazon being one of them that are crushing it. Um, you know, and, and so I think, again, it's about who's in command and, and then what are you trying to control? Um, but if you're going to stay in the 1980s, 1970s, yeah, then you're going to die. Like, you, you know, you, you have 88 million Gen X's and Gen Y's that just, they're not going to deal with it. Even if they're wrong, they don't, they don't care. They're not going to deal with it. They'll go invent some new way by selfieing it up or whatever to make the 60, 70, 100, 200 grand a year, whatever it is they care about to make their life work and you won't have them. Yeah. So a lot of these industries have been disrupted, right? By people who are, who, who aren't afraid to think differently. And I mean, when you look at what's going on now, I think it was like well, there's 80 million millennials in the U S and now we're starting to get where the gen Z is now 20 years old. So they're going to start entering the workforce. And, uh, <laughs> So if you are one of those old school companies that have been around since like, you know, World War II and, and, and that thought process where you can just tell people to sit down and shut up and do what we tell you to do and then stay at your company for 30 years and, you know, get a pension, that, those, those times are gone. And so a lot of times these organizations have to evolve in ways to, you know, work with their workforce, right? So there's different people and, and these different generations think differently. And so if you want to get the best talent to work for you, then you're going to have to think differently. And so it is, it's something that's going to have to start from the top down. And if you are an authoritarian type organization where you like to control everything, then there probably needs to be uh, letting some people go of that old way of thinking and bringing in some new thinkers. Well, last bit on that, because I just had a thought of business as a relationship is something we talk about in the book and, and it is, and relationships don't last if you treat people poorly. So it takes a lot of work. How you're going to go from that is you're going to invest a lot more time than you are right now in, in understanding yourself and, and the people you manage. And then you can do anything. Fantastic. All right, we're, going to, we're down to our last question. Um, you want to go ahead and ask it? Sure. If you can move a little today at 1245 thing. <laughs> okay, so this is also from Jason. Uh, he says, uh, I'm going to be a thorn in the side of this H to H chat. Yeah, so, baby, bring it. Here bring we go. Healthy debate time. Uh, virtual reality and chapter AI. Five, that thing. <laughs> We're gonna chapter five this shit. All right, <laughs> virtual reality and AI. What will take us too far to keep code of ethics or closer? What'll take us too far? I don't, in, I guess in the context of virtual reality and artificial intelligence. As it, are, are there ethics as it pertains to that? Yeah, I, the, the thing I saw the other day, and I can't remember where it was. I wish I could because it was a good quote. Just said, um, you know, oh, it was something around, it was talking about women and leadership at Davos and how this year 20% uh, of 
the, the attendees at Davos were female. And um, it was an interesting article. And, and I guess that's the highest it's ever been, right? Which is good and not good all at the same time. And, and it said, you know, you basically, the algorithms are written by, by a human. And, and so whoever's writing the algorithms and whatever their bias is and whatever their point of position and control is kind of dictates what the ethics are. So um, I guess the point would be is if we don't continue to make progress, and it's not about more women or more minorities or more this, it's literally about what's representative of, of the 7 billion people that walk this planet. Like what's the best representation of that? in smaller micro groups. And if you have something like Davos, Davos where the, the leaders of the world come together, or we have something like Web Summit where the tech leaders of the world come together, or whatever the thing is, um, then we wanna, we wanna make that as inclusive as possible for what represents society. Otherwise, uh, then that progress could shift in a bad direction. But um, I think as long as we're seeing progress, there will be okay and we could probably do better. That's my answer anyway. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it determines when, when does AI become sentient? right? When it becomes sentient, then we have a problem, <laughs> especially, especially when, you know, there's, there's video gamers out there teaching AI, like weaponization and, and games that teach people how to teach robots and AI, how to, how to shoot people and whatnot. So there's, there is a dark side to AI. And I think that there needs to be a code of ethics around that so that there can be you no, know, that if AI gets to a certain point, it has to be shut down or it has to be self-contained in some way, because that's a real concern down the road because if it's teaching itself then guess what it's going to come and realize eventually oh wait we i don't know how many humans we want around here this is not good for us so they're going to shut us down so that's a little that's a little frightening um now vr i think there's a lot of really interesting things pertaining to vr that is going to make uh education and just you know uh, leisure very interesting like i if i want to put on my vr and i want to take an instant vacation by sitting on a beach in costa rica i'll be able to do that you know that's that, i can do that today and you know, I think AR is going to be more in in um, for the marketers' world. I think AR is going to be more important than VR. VR is a total immersive thing, whereas AR, when we all have these glasses and we can see little layers on top of things, that's where marketers are going to be uh, wanting to pay more attention to that. But as far as, as as a code of ethics, I think something, and even Elon Musk was talking about that. It's like you know what, killer robots is not uh, the the thing of science fiction. Uh, in the next five, 10 years. I mean, that's, that's, that's crazy stuff. So hopefully, you know, we can get uh, some consensus on, on some of that stuff so it doesn't get too, too cray cray up in her. Well, <laughs> and OpenAI.org is a good site if you're interested in that. We talked about that in the last chapter of the book a little bit. Um, that's Musk and several others who don't believe that all futures are benign for AI. So OpenAI.org is a good organization to kind of stay abreast with and they seem to be on top of that. Well, if you are a human and you watch this show, you probably enjoyed it as much as I did. If you're a robot, sorry, you didn't uh, get to see it through the eyes of a human. I don't even know what that means, but I just felt like that <laughs> needed to be said because we've been talking but you about get robots. And I had to say human a couple more times. Um, hey, guys, thank you so much for being on the show. As you can tell, we have plenty of questions still to go. Uh, so if you guys have a moment on Twitter and you want to you go back and you want to answer a few feel free to do that. We know you guys are busy and um, so no problem if you can't. Uh, thank you guys once again. Congratulations on the book. For those of you who hung out here and want to see the, the cover, you missed it at the very beginning. That's what it looks like. It's called Digital Sense. And uh, Maya dropped a link to the book on Amazon. Um, so you can go get that on Amazon. Thank anytime. you, Maya. Yeah, absolutely. And if you want to pick out a random person from uh, H to H, somehow let us know. We And get their address. We'll shoot them out a copy. Uh, and we'll you. sign it with that fancy new toilet paper sticker that you made. Yes. We'll both sign yeah. it. Fancy toilet paper sticker. Good. We will we'll do that. We're gonna do a random drawing and I'll send you a uh, a note. Anyone who tweeted your name's automatically put into a drawing. Thank you guys for, for doing that, by the way. Um and we'll we'll go ahead and do that. So um uh that will be announced hopefully the next day. And um coming up, just so everybody knows who is on next week. Uh, next week, we are having the Chief Marketing Officer of Flipboard. So we're going to be talking about curation and news, uh, artificial intelligence, and they've got some really big news uh, to announce, which I think we'll be able to announce uh, next Monday. So that'll be fun. And um, thank you guys once again for trending, not even once, but just continuing to trend all the way up the chart. You guys knocked it out of the park. To everyone out there who tweeted, uh, asked questions, we really appreciate you. And thank you so much for joining us today. We'll see you guys next week, same time, same place.
See you soon. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.